what I understood from the organizers, from uh, Lotte and Timmy, that the starting point of this session was actually a performance by Sepper Bayens. Um, Sapper Bayens, and I need to say that it was a co-creation, uh, co let's say, from uh, Sepper with um, Marta Baltazar and Yasin Mrabditi, Mrabditi, I did practice, however. Um, they will explain, or they will briefly explain in a minute what this is about, and they will also show some images of this performance. So, uh, but I wanted to introduce it because it was the intention of this panel, as is said uh, in the title of the panel, the, art uh, the artist's archive as collective endeavor. What is particular about this performance, entitled Birds, is that it was created by a group of professional and non-professional performers of different ages, um, who invited also the audience to dance with them in public space. So it was not only, not, not only a co-creation by several artists, but there were uh, a lot of other people involved as well. So um, before I introduce the first speakers of this panel, um, and they will talk about this performance, but I hope they will also give you a brief glance of what they're going to work on in the future, because I, I know that they have, until yesterday, been working very hard uh, uh, on a grant application. We, the deadline was yesterday, oh, so they can probably, from the top of their heads, talk about <laughs> new projects to come. Um, but this particular performance, the Birds performance, was, a, was the, the starting point for this session about collective endeavors about thinking a, a performative archive as a group how can we how can we rethink then uh, archival practices particularly in this case also because it's a participatory performance that was collectively co-created um, it then opens up new questions that you've probably read in the program of this panel but i wanted to uh, remind or reread them to you just to have them fresh in your head. So how, how can we re reconcile the archive of performance as a collective endeavor? And to what extent do digital technologies create new pathways for this direction? And I think it nicely ties in on what has been discussed this morning already. And finally, as a last question maybe to, to, to guide us through this session, how can life re-performance be considered as an archival practice in itself. Well, but now I would like to um, invite uh, Seppe and Marta uh, here uh, up front. Um, Seppe is a choreographer and a dancer and creates works uh, on the boundary between what is traditionally considered as theater and dance, which is a bit of a different situation of the museum context discussed this morning, although Seppe already, or Seppe and Marta, both of them, have plans to work with the museum as well. They will elaborate on that, I hope. Um, but what is indeed interesting, I think, is that they both have experience with this interdisciplinary context, so in between different fields is a nice way to be, because it's, it can be very, very fertile. Uh, and I think uh, keywords of his and uh, Marta's work are, since the beginning of their collaboration, um, intergeneration, uh, intergeneral, how do I pronounce this correctly? Intergeneral, mixing ages, mixing ages is probably <laughs> just a, mixing ages, but also people from different backgrounds um, and conditions for presenting dance in its most human, vulnerable and essential form. Now, since a couple of years, he works together with Marta Baltazar. They also co-founded a VZ2 Lyon, um, they'll probably also talk about that uh, more. Um, and although also in her work, participation and co-authorship are important uh, subjects that she uh, reflects on. She's a theater maker as well uh, and a writer and graduated only recently uh, from the drama course at the Kask in Ghent. Um, and maybe nice to mention that she won the uh, Emil Zola Prize in 2020 from Sample magazine. So, and works also as a columnist for KNAK in Belgium, an important uh, magazine. Seppe and Marta, I'll leave the floor to you, and uh, I, I'm here to help you and assist you with technical issues if they might occur. Shall we start with the video? Uh, yes. 
maybe context. This is uh, not a piece of birds, which we worked on together. This is the piece uh, Sepin made. Uh, in 2018? 2018. But it's, uh, we could say that this, all the, all the pieces you make or we make are processes that go on and one uh, influences the other. It's invited. Uh, maybe I'm going to introduce this creation a bit. Um, I was 16 and I was in a school, like the secondary school, and every two years uh, they invited a choreographer or a director. And when you did this project, uh, you, you got uh, two days off of the class. That's why I did the project. <laughs> Uh, but then uh, I discovered something, I discovered like a language without words and also it was a project together with the teachers and in that project we were equal and I really like this idea and I think this was a bit the base of my work. How can we create communities like with uh, different ages but also different backgrounds? Um, how can we connect communities? And I see dance as a language that can connect people. Um, I never did like a, a dance school, but um, I was dancing in a lot of uh, performances of Mit Warlop, Cabinet K, Copper Hitere. Um, it was not like the classical way of dancing. I think I just dance without uh, any technique or, uh, but for me it was like, um, how can you express yourself without words? Uh, then I think 10 years ago, I started like uh, giving workshops under the wings of Ultima Ves in uh, Brussels. Um, and there I uh, immediately started mixing like kids and teenagers. Um, and then I started like um, like how can we invite the neighborhood also in the studio and I see the studio more as, as a meeting room. Um, after the first workshops with the neighborhood I started like um, a research about uh, mixing ages in contemporary dance and then I've met also Leon. Leon is uh, a 98 year old dancer. Uh, I've met him like six years ago, he was 92 on that moment. 
And I did this research um, about mixing ages, and he came for uh, 10 minutes, and then he left, and then the second day he came for like one hour, and the third day he brought his uh, like training suit, and he was in for the next uh, eight years. Eh? He's still in the in the ateliers and in the in the creations. Um, the first piece under the wings of Ultima Ves was Tornar, and it was quite classical, like. It was a community on stage. Uh, it was a mix of kids, uh, teenagers, professionals, non-professionals, and also Leon, 92 years old. Uh, but uh, the audience was in the uh, tribune, and the people were on stage. And then after that piece, uh, it was invited. And I was thinking, how can I write like uh, the choreography together with the audience? So there was also a research about what is the um, the stage or what is uh, the theater space and how can we change it a bit, how can we share this, the stage uh, and also um, yeah, what is co-creation with your audience. Um, in Invited the idea was also a bit how can we invite a bit uh, the world into the theater, how can we open it to everybody. Um, the cast was a bit, uh, yeah, of, is a, for me uh, a mirror of the society, but the best uh, shows were also when the audience was a mirror of the cast, so also a mirror of the society. Um, in Invited, there were also two people with uh, disability, like Frank and Stefan, and um, on that moment, 2017, in the research, we started also like a weekly atelier, a weekly workshop uh, that, it's, that was open or is still open for everybody. It was Atelier Cartier. Um, so it was every Saturday morning and we opened just a studio for everybody. We don't work with uh, inscription, it's with, it's with a free contribution. Uh, you can come once, you can stay two two years at home, you can come back. So it's very open. And I think this weekly atelier becomes also um, a bit the base of, of, of the work. Eh? So there, I never do like an audition or I meet people in this uh, workshop, in this weekly atelier. And then for the creation, we try to compose like a group that is a bit a mirror of the society. Um, so it's. I think it's all about processes and it's not about the, the creation. The creation is more and more like a side project, but the weekly atelier is the base of our work. Um, after invited, I invited Marta <laughs> as a co-creator for birds. And I think for birds we did uh, an extra step. Invited was a bit inviting the world into the theater, but there is a whole world outside the theater. So for birds, we decided to bring the theater into the world. But maybe you can tell a bit more about birds, Marta. So um, with the idea of <coughs> sharing space together and working in a participatory way, I think we uh, took it to the next level with birds by in the first place, us working together with the three of us. So we were co-creating this piece. Um, and so giving the process, it, often we were not together in the same repetitions, but I did one whole Saturday with the cast. And then um, I, I gave the, what, whatever we did uh, to Seppe, and he worked with this. So it was an ongoing uh, process in which I think the question of uh, archiving is also quite interesting. Um, how do we archive for each other as, as uh, artists working together in, in long uh, and intense processes? And then, uh, of course, co-creating this with, uh, with our cast, who is, I think, the youngest uh, person was uh, nine when she started uh, then, uh, working on birds. The oldest is 78 at the moment, so um, there's people with disabilities, there's uh, professional dancers, but also people who are, have been dancing for the first time now. So how to create a shared language, uh, a shared space, and also a community, um, and how to make this community really the base of, of your artistic work and your artistic language. And then um, by going into public space and not um, 
putting uh, um, uh, like uh, barriers around your dance floor. You, you, we, we try to also co-create with the city in a way and uh, we also rehearsed mostly in public space which was quite difficult with the corona times but we managed um, and how, uh, yeah, we, we, we were very influenced by um, the movement that already exists in this space. So yeah, I'm always thinking about the theme of this panel, of course. I feel like in a way we also did an archiving of what movement in public space means or could mean, uh, how to make it, uh, how to share it, how to make it more meaningful, how to um, uh, en yeah, enlighten it in a way. Um, so every uh, person passing by uh, is invited to be a part of BIRDS um, and to also write the choreography, choreography together uh, with us. Maybe it's nice now to watch the trailer. gonna tell you something about um, practices like uh, in invited we were working with three things it's like uh, demonstrating things guiding the audience and then also generating so the audience can also decide to do things um, in birds it was more about infiltrating so we don't want to claim the public space but how can we infiltrate this was the first uh, Fast, and then the second was second one was more sublimating. How can we uh, make things from the public space stronger, like a walking line? We work we worked a lot with lines, um, and then the third thing was more the interaction. How can we build up an interaction with? There were three groups. There is the cast, but also uh, the theater audience, and also the passing people. So, um, but. In general, we have also three other practices, and it's a mixing, inverting, and affirming. Marta. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, I think like which is vis visible in the the trailers, but also uh, what you talked about already um, by attempting to be a reflection of society, an honest reflection. So in all its uh, diversity. Um, we tend to mix a lot of uh, uh, groups, so mixing is 
like the main principle, um, which we do in, in actually uh, all of our practices, even uh, when we teach in schools, it's very important that it's not just um, the, 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 the eight-year-olds, for example, but then we put a group of elderly people of, or people with disabilities together and we, uh, we always, tr uh, yeah, mixing really is the basic and the, the, the meeting of the other is actually, yeah, the, um, yeah, where all the artistic uh, language comes from. The second one is inverting. We've met a lot of people throughout uh, the last years, you, even more people throughout even more years. Uh, and it's very nice uh, to see how a lot of people um, uh, don't uh, stay in the stereotype roles that are determined for them in society. For example, a lot of youngsters who come, uh, who have worked with us for, for a long time, now give workshops or they are really seen as the example in workshops because they really have the most experience. Also a lot of people with, uh, with disabilities who we work with have been there um, yeah, every Wednesday, every Saturday, so they're really seen as the example. They, they give the, 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 some exercises, but they also um, uh, are engaged in, in many, many different ways, which are not uh, probably um, uh, easy to imagine uh, in, in classical institutes. Um, and this uh, is because of our third uh, main principle that is affirming. Uh, we have something that's called a temporary uh, um, community, which we build up every time. <coughs> but in this temporality, it's very important to also have a, a sort of sustainability. So to meet the same people over and over again and to do the same exercises and create um, a language together with them throughout a long uh, period of time, uh, and therefore this language is really theirs, uh, not not ours imposed on them. But by doing it and by developing it, developing it together with them, it it really becomes a language we all all write together, um, and which uh, helps uh, all of us, also us, I think, grow mm -hmm. in a, in into. Um, yeah, uh, this this inverting idea. Uh, I could be the the child. I could be not be the teacher in a workshop because I the the, the eight year olds have started uh, rapping and now the the whole atelier has switched around and we have became become a rapping atelier and they're much better at it, of course. So I will learn from them and in this way, um, a lot of things can emerge because it's such an open democratic and inclusive uh, space. Which is also very, yeah, one more thing, which is a very nice side effect of the performances we do is that you, after a while, are not sure anymore who is cast, who is audience, who is just passing by, because a lot of people tend to take the stage because it's such a warm, and safe environment. So a lot of after after the performance, there's always this question: Yeah, w was she part of it? Was he part of it? So that's a very nice. I, for me, that's a sign of that it's a very free space to um, to to claim also some space in. Um, can I end with a little exercise, Lotta? <laughs> Um, we will show it, and Lotte, can you close your eyes? Huh? I'm going to watch you. Now you can also decide to open your eyes and you look at me. Then I close my eyes, when I open,
Thank you, Jan and Bob. Thank you, uh, Sapa and Marta. We will have time later on during the Q&A maybe to elaborate a bit on your future project and your work in a museum. I think that would be nice for this audience too. But now it's time for our second uh, speaker of today or this afternoon. Uh, her name is Annette Decker. She's a curator and a researcher. Oh, you want to switch switch order? Okay, that, that was I was just following the program, but unless you pref prefer to do it differently. So Annette is a curator and researcher. She's also currently a professor or assistant professor uh, cultural analysis and archival and information studies at the University of Amsterdam and a visiting professor and co-director of the Center for the Study of the Networked Image at London South Bank University. She has uh, published a lot, numerous books and essays on, uh, for instance, uh, documentation as art, uh, co-edited with uh, Gabriela Gyanashi, um, with Routledge, which is a very recent book, uh, but also a book on curating digital art. I think many of you in the room will uh, be interested in that, from presenting and collecting digital art to networked co-curating. Um, and her monograph, Collecting and Conserving uh, Net Art, I think is also of interest to this audience, which is indeed a seminal work in the field of digital art conservation. And I, in her talk, she will address alternative ways of digital art curation and preservation, and she'll introduce a concept that I think also we will uh, be very interested in, is networks of care. And that's, the floor is yours. Thanks very much for inviting me. I'm a very good place to be here. Uh, it's been an interesting day already, and I think indeed, uh, hopefully at least, uh, the things that I'll be talking about now uh, will resonate in interesting ways. Um, oh yeah, sorry. Thank you. You can move it. Yeah, I'll move it. Excellent. Sorry for that. I won't repeat. It's all right. Not a problem. Didn't say much at all. Um, <laughs> So, I'm going to tell you a little bit uh, of a story. In 2016, I received this email. Uh, it's by Igor Strommeyer, an artist that I had known and worked with since the late 1990s when I was curating at the Netherlands Media Art Institute, among others. I opened the files, and this is basically what I saw, you know, it's not much to see, really. There's this image of what appears to be a woman sitting on the toilet. There is something. And there is another something. And then there was this sound file, which I don't even know. No, you won't hear. Hang on. Let me try. No, there you go. <laughs> that was it. Um, after two years, same day, I received a similar email, again from Igor. And that glitch shouldn't be there, but maybe it should. I actually don't know. <laughs> anyway, um, and he's asking me now to put the files that he sent this time, encrypted files, somewhere safe. And again, two years later, on the same day, I got another email. However, after the second email, I got quite intrigued. It's like, what, what the hell? What is this? You know, what am I going to do with this? I, I'm not, you know, an archivist. I'm not a conservator. I'm no interest in being one either. I train people, though, for being them. Um, but Igor was kind enough to explain a little bit, at least, to me about his project. Um, he, he called the minus move four times as a performative action in which over a period of several years, from 2016 to 2022, and this is the year, 2022, I still haven't received anything, I'm quite worried. He approaches this decreasing group of people, so hence why I'm worried, to keep several files, a random selection from his earlier project's expansion safe. So what is this all about? Igor has been working in performance and net art since the 
early 1990s. And in 2011, he decided to ritually delete all his works that he had put online, his net art pieces, from 1996 to 2007. They didn't look the same anymore, didn't function necessarily, because settings had changed and the web had been updated. The context had changed, so he was like, there's no really need anymore to save these works. They don't function in the same way as I intended that they would. So he preferred deletion to aesthetic loss. Yet he did find several fragments, documents, and documentation of his artwork, and he documented his performance in, in the way that he did. Now, um, sending people, you know, he knew uh, emails. So this is the work. And yeah, digital art, or net art, is often understood, and uh, this, at least how I understand it as well, is involving a set of representational, compositional, and functional principles. Often the aesthetic is not merely about the look and feel, but much more about the social technical restrictions, uh, including the skills and authorship, uh, but also self-reference, uh, its network and the culture that they uh, work in. So I came up with a sort of short you know, description of digital art uh, that I describe as a process of creation that is heterogeneous, involving incompatibilities, constraint rules, and a certain amount of improvisation, in which its own structures can be renegotiated continuously. In other words, going from this, digital art moves from art as a discrete, stabilized, original, or authoritarian object to art that is performative distributed, endlessly proliferating and circulating, processual without a final state, and also multi-authored, or at least where authorship is shared or obscured. So what does this mean when we translate it to the practice of preservation, or archiving for that matter? Now, instead of focusing on the material qualities or the unique and original artwork, what if objects are not static? and final products, but starting points that are seen as recursive or iterative. Loss is seen as gain, and authority, as well as accountability and potentially also ownership, which has passed today, is shared with and by community members. In such an approach, the art is leading, and hence such a practice focuses on process, distribution, network exchange, and collaboration. I'm repeating these words. So to come to terms with, well, what does that mean for preservation? I come up with the concept of networks of care, which is, you know, as I describe here, is basically based on a transdisciplinary attitude, a combination of professionals and non-experts who manage or work on a shared project. For it to succeed in a way, outside of the institutional framework, it needs to have these sort of characteristics. And they can be traced in a way by looking at how the networks gives agency to individuals, instead of answering the questions how, how individuals actually create networks. The network becomes part of the artwork. So you could say, and I'm just briefly really going through this because we don't have that much time. A network of care is based on an informal structure, a transdisciplinary attitude, a combination of professionals, non-expert, I mentioned that. Uh, everyone in the group has access to all the documents, the documentation. We can discuss about that later. Ideally, it would be an open system or a dynamic set of tools that is used and cared for where people can add, edit, and manage information, track changes that are made. And such a system is important because when someone leaves, someone else can take over and can still find all the information that is available and add to it, of course, again. And in, in that sense, the network should be dynamic so that individuals can indeed move quite quickly between different things. And so this is the forking possibility. So I use the concept of care as a tool, in a way, to analyze the activity of caring. And I'm basing my idea of care on Anne-Marie Moll's uh, The Logic of Care, as well as Maria Puig de la Bella Casa, Matters of Care. But it's the activity of caring that happens in preservation in which I understand care as specific, situated, and complex, yet also as relational and processual activity that develops over time, rather than being performed in a single moment. Also, care is never neutral. It is ambivalent. It is simultaneously necessary and oppressive. 
It suggests a fact, but also asymmetrical power relations. So a network of care and preservation is negotiated between different actors, including humans, but also material, technical elements, non-humans, bots, you name it, NFTs, who knows. I'd like to suggest that the implementation of networks of care could lead to a more sustainable solution for digital preservation, particularly. But also, again, I think it's useful to rethink conservation practices as a whole. So when analyzing now different examples, and looking as like, okay, where can I see these networks of care appearing? I came across uh, several different types in a way that I'm trying now to get my head around. So the different types of network of care, I mean, usually these things as, you know, what happens, they emerge from this urgent emotional issue that people have, they feel they have a stake in something. They have either participated or they feel close to it because it, it's, it's really affected them when they were looking at it at first. But the organizational part is also quite interesting. Sometimes a network of care is part actually of an artwork. It could be semi-initiated. It could also be by invitation, after the fact, after the, the works are not there anymore. Perhaps that's Igor's case, right? The post-mortem almost network. It could also be a sort of research in images that is set up to look at, indeed, what is this network of care? But potentially there's others as well. So I'll move on. But briefly returning to Igor here. So Igor is setting up his own network of care by sort of invitation. The work ceased to exist, but as a prolongation that's now happening. And it happens in a different way. Taking fragments, but reinterpreting them, decontextualizing and recontextualizing them again. And what I like about the project, and I hope you could yeah, hear that already when I started talking about it, is that the extended period of waiting for something to happen has that affirms the reality of the event that unfolds. Even if the outcome is completely open, it can completely disappoint, and yeah, knowing myself, it will. But that's also the beauty of the work. It's the process towards it. It's the road to wherever. And as he mentions himself here as well, it's a kind of a cycle, a durational, perhaps never-ending online performance with its natural rhythm, being constructed, deconstructed, and reconstructed anew, but this time differently. Who knows exactly what comes afterwards, but there's certainly no end to this cycle, because every trace, every move you make has its consequences. Now, I think interesting to the project today is that it forms a network. So by presenting the project, uh, his project, uh, as public gifts in a way, and choosing circulation of close friends over commercial or established art worlds, Igor's approach refers to a network that includes points of convergence. Yet likely this happens at undecided moment, where different actors find a point of connection. So far, I've met two people who are also in the loop. Maybe some of you here as well. I don't know you yet. Very interesting. <laughs> but here, there's a shared interest, but the roles of artist, audience, curator and conservator are allowed and sometimes even encouraged to merge, leading to various and multiple narratives and solutions. Here, the challenge of preservation shifts from the object to developing a network that supports something. And I'm yeah, particularly interested in discussing the potential of these projects as models and methods of future and also potentially present and even perhaps past preservation practices. So what this proposal and concept of a network of care invites to think is a world constantly done and undone through encounters that accentuate both the attraction um, sorry, now I'm getting lost here, of closeness as well as awareness of alterity. Moreover, marked by unexpectedness, they require a situated ethicality to enable an effective and accountable decision-making process that ensures a more resilient preservation practice. So for now, I hope to have shown with this example that preservation is not merely about objects and new tools and spaces, but much more about new socially organized networks, different structures and systems, actors, human, and non-human actors come, hand to come together around a joint goal. 
Seeing preservation through the lens of the concept of care emphasizes these different relations. And more importantly, it also shows how preservation is not only a matter of making well-argued individual choices. Rather, it's a process that grows out of collaborative and continuing attempts to attune knowledge and creativity. So last year, I was part of a workshop together with uh, Marina and Aga, and we decided indeed to, to break it down into three potential future questions. What if the media specifics of digital art in this case, but I would indeed say this could be broader, impermanence, variability, processuality and ambiguity become the guiding parameters for preservation methods? What if the social specifics of digital art become the guiding parameters for decision-making practices? What if the pro proprietary specifics of art become the guiding parameters for collecting processes? Thank you very much. Thanks for bringing in this perspective from digital art, it has, which has surprisingly a lot in common with the questions we deal with uh, regarding the preservation of uh, performance arts. Um, I'm sure we have many questions, so do I. Keep, please keep them uh, in your mind or note them down, because there's one uh, speaker left, and then we have ample time to discuss and go into dialogue with our panelists. Our next or final speaker of this panel uh, is uh, Cezin Romi. She's a senior librarian at Archivist at Salt in Istanbul, Turkey. And in addition to managing the library, she carries out the necessary processes for the research and access of archives at Salt Research. I think she'll elaborate on that uh, further. And she was involved in several research and archival projects and wrote also uh, uh, some uh, books or edited volumes on that. Mm -hmm. In her talk, she will, as I understood correctly, enlighten us about SALT's ongoing process to develop a kind of web-based archive or a database, one could call it, I guess, sort of the documentation environment for performance, uh, performance art uh, in Turkey. Uh, in the final of second part of the 20th century, I, if I could From 80s to 90s. From 80s to 90s. Mm. Um, so, but I'll let you explain that yourself, um, of course. Yeah, you need to buy the presentation. There we are. Firstly, it is a great pleasure for me to be here, part of this event. I would like to thank all organizers for their kind invitation and for these exciting events. I hope we can discuss further after the presentations. Uh, in this presentation, I will try to give a brief information about SALT and the institution's archiving practices. Focusing on art archives at the institution, I will explain how different artist archives from, form a collective knowledge in re, and their relation with performance from an archivist perspective. SALT is a not-for-profit cultural institution in public service engaging in research, exhibitions, pub publications, web projects, conferences and other public programs in Turkey. The institution works in, in, in the intersections of different disciplines, such as uh, vi uh, visual practices, the built, built environment, social life, and economic history. The institution's programs are distributed at Salt Galata and Salt Beolu buildings in Istanbul. Library, archive, and online entities are the components of Salt Research. SALT Research comprises a specialized library and an archive of physical and digital sources and documents on art, architecture, design, social and economical history. As part of long-term long commitment to digitizing resources at SALT Research, the institution makes documents and sources universally, universally available via saltresearch.org together with the catalog of local access publications. 
The online archive includes 1.9 million documents and sources, while the publication collection comprises over 100,000 volumes. This is a view from an archive project, uh, uh, from an artist archive. This is view when we received the archival materials and we were just categorizing and uh, trying to understand the content. This is view from Salt Research Office where we digitize all materials, uh, 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 all materials, and if we don't have the necessary equipment, we send the materials outside and uh, have support from other sources. This is view from the library, from the pub, uh, from the shelves, and this is saltresearch.org, our online catalog where we can uh, you can search both the library and archive collections together. If you would like to do search just in the archive collection, you can use archives.saltresearch.org where you can uh, view all content and uh, download it free of charge and use for research purposes. Art archives at SALT focus on the history of art in Turkey after the 50s. These are the sub-collections of art archives at SALT research. SALT began to focus on documenting the post-50s due to the lack of fundamental research on modern and contemporary art history in Turkey. Safeguarded chiefly by private individuals, physical memory is dispersed in different hands with little public knowledge of their existence. Researchers usually work with limited materials they can reach. This, uh, this situation motivated SALT to assemble resources focusing on a group of critically important, important artists. Archives kept by these artists were catalogued and made accessible online at SALT Research. These archives, which form a collective knowledge, reflect the creative environment of the period in Turkey through artist practices and help to re-evaluate history from a local, regional and international as well as historical perspective. Artist archives at SALT include archival materials related to the artist practices. They include, they include documentation of their artworks, reflect information about the exhibition activities they contributed, and present a literature on them. These artists produce in diverse forms, such as painting, video, installation, and performance. If the artist has an artwork in the form of the performance, the archive directly includes existing materials related to the performance. Please see some examples here. Mostly these archive present photographs from the happenings and performances, ephemeras, reviews, and very rarely records of the performances from different artist archives, from their works. Uh, for example, in this example, artist incidentally kept the remnants and components of the performance he realized during the 70s. Therefore, the archive directly includes their photos. It is important to note that they become meaning meaningful when the artist tells the context. Otherwise, it is hard to identify and describe and, of course, tell to the researchers to use. Moni is another example among the artist archives at Salt Research. His artworks are mostly in the form of performance. During the research and archiving process, we work very closely with the artist in order, in order to describe tell the details of performances he did between 1987 uh, and 1990 in Turkey as much as possible. We, uh, we add specific, specific descriptive information about e each performance in order to uh, supplement the archival materials, which mostly consist of photos and ephemeras. These are photos from his archive. And the archival catalog includes all uh, information about each performance according to the artist's uh, views. 
Our ongoing research project at SALT aims to explore and document performance art practices in Turkey from the end of 80s to the end of 90s. As I mentioned in the beginning of the presentation, there is a lack of information on the recent art history of Turkey. When we began this project, we were unable to reach primary sources. So, we are currently trying to bring together information, documents, and audiovisual materials from a variety of sources, including the artist archives at SALT Research. Narratives and memories of contributors of the performances and the archival materials they could keep enable us to follow the traces. We are trying to compile information such as title, artist and all contributors, venue and city festival on each performance with a brief summary. Our aim is presenting a comprehensive inventory on the performances that took place in Turkey uh, during this period and compiled archival materials for future researchers. However, archiving and digitization of these materials at SALT Research directly address common questions on documentation, preservation, and interpretation of performance. So, we organized Stage Record Archive Conference in February. It was a two-day conference which was the fir first public program as part of this ongoing research project. We invited participants from diverse backgrounds and regions in order to discuss and present different case studies projects. The conference records are also available at SALT's YouTube channel. This research project aims to map and visually decode critical works expressed in the form of dance, live, and experimental theater in Turkey between, between mid-80s until late-90s. The long-term research will be presented through a web project and a comprehensive exhibition in September 2022. And compiled archives will be part of SALT research. We consider that the archive is never complete and this is a long-term sustainable research project which will continue with support of witnesses of the period. So the project will not be finalized with the launch of the website and exhibition and it will be still in its evolution. Thank you. Thank you, Cezine. Um, I think these chairs are put there for the three of the four of you to sit uh, to form this uh, for this Q and A uh, session. So please, can I invite you to come back in front? I think we can have an extreme, in, extremely interesting and diverse discussion because we have here, here multiple angles on the subject of how to collectively. Uh, think about conservation and preservation of performance and digital arts. Um, before I open the floor to the audience, I would like to kick off, as this is the, my role, of course, as a chair, which I, actually I, I had several f questions and I think I can summarize them basically in three large questions to all of you. The first one would be why, the second one will be who, and the third one will be how. And I'll <laughs> Explain myself a little bit more. Why? Why would you? Why would you want to archive your performance in the first place? If we think, can think of the, the ontological definition that was uh, pronounced this morning, which is an age-old definition, of course, that the performance is here, live, in, in the presence of an audience. And, this, uh, and, and even if you go into a public space, it has to do with this live experience. How can you archive it or maybe uh, conserve it for the future or want to redo it, maybe? That's one question. Particularly referring to what you uh, described as um, with regard to birds as I understand correctly, that it was about a temporary um, space, a temporary experience. Mm -hmm. Community, that was the word, the temporary community. So if it's about, tempor is, is the whole piece of art is about this contemporary community, then, it is con it, then it's temporary, right? Um, so that's a bit of a, a, a large question, I, know, I hope, and I hope that you can maybe then afterwards um, connect to that as well with regard to your subjects. 
It also connects maybe to the question of ownership that was uh, asked this morning by Bartabara. Who owns then the piece? And how can we, in, the, in a community piece, think of ownership? Also, when we think of network art and, and preservation. Okay, <laughs> difficult question. I think this morning I would have said, no, we don't need to archive anything. It's, it's all about the now and the here and the people we are with now. But I feel like after uh, <laughs> hearing you, and especially about your, uh, your work on digital, on, on preserving and conserving digital art, which indeed has many similarities with preserving uh, performance arts, I feel like this could be a super nice exercise to extend this, this idea of care, which is, is super important in our work, which is probably the basic of our work, to extend it even more and make it more sustainable, make it more uh, radical, probably. For example, the idea of authorship in our work is, um, in reality, it's super shared, but economically, uh, I think uh, we own the piece. So uh, how to uh, also think about this in economic terms, in, 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 um, yeah, in, in terms of how yeah, our whole art is cons conser uh, conserved. And I think when you talk about the parameters of preserving that it's a very interesting and, and inspiring exercise to to have this open, shared, participatory, democratic um, uh, idea and exercise also in on the long run in how this this piece will will die, how this temporary community will um, live on, how um, our network will be a lot more than just the piece we dance. Um, yeah. Sapa or Annette, do you want to connect to that or uh, this question? Yeah, and I was also thinking we, we talk a lot a lot about processes and I think how can you archive processes? It's something new. It's not like the product. You cannot um, how do you say it? You cannot touch it, or it, it's something. It's um, also in birds. I think there is an imagination, and it's in the head, and it's in the. And to archive this kind of things, sometimes it's yeah, it's a challenge. Because and do you do that? You do you document, so to say, your process, like by taking pictures or video or registering, or I don't know. Yeah, even but it's a live, it's a yeah. live uh, performance. Eh? Sorry, Marta. <laughs> Yeah, I think what I said earlier, we do it for each other already, this processing. So probably the, the preserving of, um, of the process would also be about creating tools for each other, for other artists, for maybe also for politicians, uh, to creating tool, tools for creating communities which I would like to send uh, like a package of tools to uh, some of the politicians. They, they need it. <laughs> tools for collaboration. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. And that's, I think, the question of why is even more pressing with regard to digital art, I guess, because there it's not really lost. Yeah, of course, in the performance sense is also lost, but <laughs> there you have, yeah, it's the same question, actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's actually the same question. Everything's lost, yeah. yeah. And now we gain. Now I think it's it's crucial. I think it's crucial to remember and to have a history. However, there is never one history. And I think that's the core of what I'm trying to get at. And I think that's what also Azabanga in that this morning mentioned is like, well, there's not one way of doing. And that's the beauty of it. There is multiple things and they should acknowledge each other and learn from each other potentially, but maybe even not. Just let the museum do what they do, it's fine. As long as they also acknowledge there are other methods and those are just as relevant. And then I think that's the beauty of the work that we do, that we can actually emphasize that. And we can show there is multiple ways of doing. And um, the most important thing is though that it is remembered, but it will always be remembered differently, no matter if you have the sort of best practice. I mean, there is no best practice in that way at all. I mean, we will all remember tomorrow, today differently. So yeah, just take that as a starting point and then start thinking about, well, what does it actually then mean to, uh, to do preservation? Mm -hmm. I think that's what this is about.
Okay, that, I think that's a nice bridge maybe to you, uh, Cézine. I can think that I, I can imagine that you can connect to that as well. Like how you have different, well, first of all, the why question for in why, what is the, the main uh, aim for you as or for your institution to do it? That would maybe be nice to just pinpoint briefly and probably also, yeah, the, the, the different ways to do it, like connecting to Annette's remark. I think in documentation of performance, the artist and the archivist perspectives are different. I don't know, please correct me if you think different. Because, you know, for, for an archivist, any piece is something to complete uh, the puzzle, you know, which is not known. It is uh, all pieces are potential sources to learn to, uh, for new knowledge. For, uh, for the researchers, for the uh, history and other future pro uh, project. For an RF, I, I am not sure because I am really working very closely with the artists during these archiving processes. And I am not sure if they keep uh, these materials for archiving pur purposes. Uh, as I observed, they are mostly producing these materials as, you know, uh, sources for their uh, production mm -hmm. or co to continue their artworks and also there is another dilemma for example when uh, some of the, some artists they use documentation of the performance as another artwork piece also there are also some examples there for our uh, case at salt we are doing this work for research because as i explained in the presentation the problem is it is hard it is not possible to reach the primary sources all the time even it is not too far away from today they are not kept mostly they are uh, kept by individual artists they could manage to keep them not for archiving purposes I, most of them are by chance for their personal mm -hmm. you know issues they kept and we are trying to bring them together to form a collective knowledge for the researchers for the history because mm -hmm. if the historians or if the researchers they cannot reach these materials they cannot cor uh, they cannot uh, learn the correct uh, history, correct story, and then they cannot interpret it and add new layers to these uh, objective pieces. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Susan. I think that's a very important uh, remark you make about that, that we really need to distinguish between different kinds of archives and different kinds of reason why people uh, collect things. A museum or an, an institute or a library does it for different purposes, and there's also a difference between, I guess, uh, uh, an artist well, an artist, are, you, you collect different kinds of archives, an artist preparing for a project, uh, a performance project, and that whole process can be archived in a way, but that's something different than, of course, the performance itself. So there we have different kinds of archives to deal with and different kinds of questions, I guess, to deal with. So, and that nicely uh, gives me another bridge to my second large question, who should do this work? And I think you already gave a part of the answer, like it is different, of course, it, does the art, uh, artist, him or herself, has, is in charge of your own, of archiving or, or documenting your own work? Does it need to be done by a museum or an institution or a theatre institute? Or, and I, I very much like Nat, uh, Annette's uh, suggestion of a network, I mean, a network of people, uh, either professional people or even non-professional people, collaborating on a, a kind of hybrid archive, not just that it's somewhere stored in the basement of a museum, or but, but that, that it's a kind of collaborative endeavor, right? So that's maybe something uh, you, uh, Annette, can pick up again to, well, you already introduced it, but it would be nice to maybe, or if you can touch on that as well. I don't know if you can, um, well, I'll rephrase my, my, maybe my question to you and then Annette can answer. Can you also think of your own work, because we talked about temporary communities, that the work of art lives on through this idea of network within all these people who were involved, so that it has a, a, like a second life somewhere else in, an, in the community of where it, it took place, and where you maybe as an artist are not involved anymore as an artist? Yeah, it, uh, we talked about it on the... Uh in our little Zoom meeting before that um, 
probably for me the most accurate way to um, to preserve the performance as well as the process is to do it in the most human way and talk to everyone involved or or even um, dance with any everyone involved because what you say it's a plural experience there's many um, perspectives in it and it's the the um, relation of all these people and as well of all these pers perspectives that make the work but you would also I think have to if you want to conserve something like birds I think you would have to talk to audiences at, as well and because their experience is probably the most I mean one of the most essential parts of the I don't know if that is already a thing talking to audiences to preserve probably it is but mm. um, it's difficult but it's yeah, I think also the, the community is also a network and I think we work also like intersectionals. We, we have also education, we have care, we have um, like, uh, it's not only art a community and I think we can archive it from different um, uh, views, also like uh, academic research or, uh, but I think when you bring all these things together, maybe you have like a community uh, archive it's it's quite funny because they like the 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 uh, pupils who are in our ateliers sometimes they have to do it for school <laughs> they have to write their experiences and like what exercise you, so they are <laughs> actually everyone is at Sonnelied, the the um, center for people uh, with disabilities they also they the the people who never like they they also uh, know all these um, exercises we do they all I think everyone ar archives except for us maybe we don't do that but <laughs> you have there already a, a large starting point yet yeah. <laughs> now maybe and that would be maybe a question then for Annette and then for every one of you of course the next question of um, how then or what exactly but that ties into what Marta said about the children writing down their experience or having an, an, an audience reception analysis could be something. But um, what exactly are we trying to archive? And I think I can, from my background as performance studies scholar, and that's what we teach our students or with regard to theater historiography, that there are different kinds of sources, of course, about the, 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 the process, we can, we can um, we talk about direct sources like the props and the remnants of a performance, like the, the costumes, the props, that kind of things that, can be, that we can keep. Uh, we can also talk about indirect uh, documents such as reviews in the newspaper about a particular performance or a piece of art. Uh, we can talk about scripts, we can talk about things that remain that are not the performance themselves. And then of course the typical registration such as videos, photos, audio. But with regard to, to digital art, I must, I must admit that becomes more difficult to me to imagine, maybe for other people in the room it's not. Um, could you maybe expand a bit on that? What exactly do we then want to preserve or can we preserve? And how? Yeah, I mean, yeah, again, I think it's a really difficult question because there's so many answers. You can do it in so many different ways. It really depends on the work, on, I think, also what the artist wanted with it, on the sources you have available. I mean, there's many people who really stick to, okay, this is what it was and this is how we keep it. Uh, but there's also more and more a talk about, um, well, we can't because the, the equipment becomes obsolete, so we need to come up with different issues that we emulate uh, things or we reinterpret. And then it becomes closer and closer to performance and theatre. Because there you do reinterpretation much more, yeah. where there is something that is you know, a constant, but there's other things that constantly shift. The players don't live 100 years. So, yeah... There Those are essential, mm -hmm. but they're not that essential. So it's really about finding the essence in a, in a way of the work and that, that will uh, shift. And that's the interesting thing about, uh, I think, of conservation is, is yeah, embracing those shifts in time as well and don't be afraid of like, oh, we need to do it in this way because, yeah, again, there is no one way and it's fine to just... Uh, yeah, shift your tune in, in multiple ways. And I think that's where we can learn a lot from other practices. Uh, we talked this morning also about uh, more oral cultures and 
uh, I don't know, uh, things that would be, you know, dug into the ground and there the object's not there anymore, but there's something else there. So there's so many ways and yeah, it depends on what you want to do. Yeah. I think that ties in, but maybe I want to give the floor to Cezine again about something we briefly discussed during lunch about, well, what these networks is about sharing knowledge, right? And it can be art either artistic knowledge or, 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 or other kinds of knowledge, but sharing kinds of knowledge, not only in a traditional way, but also in informal kinds of way, embodied knowledge that, 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 or tacit knowledge, that kind of things. Cezine, do you want to maybe briefly say something about the different ways or the different kinds of things you preserve? I mean, with the question, what exactly do you then try to preserve and open up to the audience or to open up to researchers in your case? Uh, any piece of the puzzle leading to an understanding of the performance is very critical in archiving. Uh, we are not thinking object-based. For example, you know, you said costumes. Uh, we, we are not obsessed in preserving the object itself, but we are uh, mostly giving importance uh, to keep the inform uh, information knowledge. For example, maybe photos of the objects could be part of that. Uh, also, not only uh, photos of the last final work uh, is uh, are critical. Also, creative process is important. Correspondence before the uh, artwork produced, uh, notes, schedules, uh, could be part of that because they also uh, present uh, the network between the artist and the artistic environment. On the other hand, all uh, documentation, if includes if it includes the records, they are very valuable, but mostly uh, they don't have because during that period it was not possible to uh, record everything. And also, I am not sure if the artist really they want to do that. It is another question and reviews uh, from the newspapers, journals, from the critic, uh, critics' perspectives are all part of that. It is important to present uh, all documents as, as much as possible. I think we should also avoid presenting them from the artist's per per only from the artist's per perspective, mm -hmm. because it could be sometimes more sh subjective. Because our, you know, cultural uh, institutions role is very critical in making these materials accessible. You know, we are presenting knowledge from an objective uh, perspective. We are just giving the raw material and then the researchers will interpret it and mm -hmm. add new layers. We are, you know, leaving them free in that case. Okay. May I, may I briefly respond? Because I think, um, as I said before briefly, I was, uh, I'm, I'm teaching you know, uh, archival and information studies. So that is indeed all about that. Um, and one of the things that I've always really struggled with also, uh, you know, in, in these kind of presentations is the use of objectivity. Because I think we cannot do this. We, we cannot think in, in such ways anymore. I mean, there is not such a thing as we do this objectively. Now, you try to make it neutral, but there is no neutrality involved. And there is a difference there. I think that's really important to emphasize. And it's not only in the work that the people do, but it's also within the systems that we use. The way that we categorize things, the way that we describe things, the way that the uh, interface is shown to you online, those are all prescriptive. They all have these biases involved in them. And um, it's important, it's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's important to recognize that and to understand the implications of it, I think. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that's just something that I want to add. Yeah. Sap, you want to respond uh, and then I'll open up. Yeah, and I think for us it's also like birds or invited, it's, it's more, it's an idea and it's a, a catalysator. So it starts things, but we don't know the result in advance. And I think it's a bit the same in this, uh, um, in this way of archiving things or um, but it's and, difficult, yeah. eh? there are no categories, and uh, so we have to rename it, I think, or to invent a new language, to, uh, or a new catalysator. Eh?
Yeah, and, and to me, that is the most interesting things where, where artists come up with. I mean, I've seen several examples, indeed, where artists start working through their own material. I'm not saying that artists should do that at all. I mean, go and do your thing. But in the case, some of the cases that they do, it, it becomes really enriching to see how they start naming the stuff that they archive. And you come into uh, new vocabularies, you come into new ideas of, well, maybe this is not a performance, maybe this is a chair, or, you know, I don't know. I'm not that creative, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's where it becomes really exciting, and because they make you rethink what you're actually doing. And I think, if anything, that's what the archive is really about, is, is to make you rethink, like you mentioned as well. It's about those that use it that gets you know, new ideas and, and put them into a new context. Mm -hmm. And be open uh, and uh, transparent about the categories you use and realize that someone made a choice to use this one. Could have been different. Okay, I think we have 10 more minutes for uh, questions from the audience. Uh, okay, I see the first one here. I have a question. I had an idea while you were sp uh, sp speaking because uh, uh, you mentioned uh, these uh, direct sources as uh, sources of knowledge about the piece, but uh, all, but referring to material sources. And what can be, if we speak about immaterial practice, uh, like I immediately said, like for me, there is a lot of immaterial sources that give the key knowledge for the for the work. It can be a conversation, it can be even the practice of surfing on the web, it can be whatever else example I can give, and that would uh, give much more knowledge about uh, about the piece than, I don't know, a, a prop that comes from a piece of clothes, for example, or something like that. So it's completely... Uh, like hypothetical for now, but how is is uh, a source uh, of knowledge for the immaterial work can also be material. It it really depends on the you know content that we can, it depends on the process and it may di differs in each case. Uh, sometimes it is possible to, uh, you know, to. It, sometimes it is possible to get something concrete, but sometimes also that uh, you uh, we are not able to reach something concrete, and in that case we are just giving the for uh, it through the metadata. We are telling it through the metadata, uh, for example, about the performance, and, uh, including the information about the performance and at least the researcher or the user can know that this uh, can know that information so it depends on the situation there is really no formula for that um, yeah and i think also for example in the performance it's not about uh, the object it's not about the um, scenography it's more about practices i think and like marta said like this mixing inverting affirming it's more a practice uh, and it's more describing the process than the object. You want to respond? No. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, first, here and then, stuff. First, stuff, then. Hi. Uh, thanks, everyone. Um, I was pretty disappointed this morning because uh, all the discussions were uh, very museum-centered. Of course, there were some interventions that questioned that, um, whereas this afternoon, luckily, uh, Sky opened up and uh, it appeared that there are many other actors involved. Um, uh, so, you, um, uh, so it, it would be nice to if there would be a follow-up conference to, to really investigate this more systematically. Because still, it, it, we have started from the museum, really. And the other, it also has been very work-centered, even this afternoon. Uh, so my question would be, how would we then conceive of, well, uh, someone this morning suggested to call this the archive, but you can, can call it uh, oeuvre or life of the artists. Um, 
or a more organically grown context of the artwork, how can we um, archive that or, um, or preserve that um, or put differently? Is it not dangerous to um, approach this problematic uh, mainly from the angle of how should the museum acquire a performance mm. rather than, mm. hey, Seppe and Marta are creating this fascinating processes and 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 how how are they, why are they doing this what is their story um whether or not then this piece uh, belongs mm -hmm. to a museum i know this is a different this is a dance context i know but so this would be an invitation to yeah. also after today mm -hmm. to uh, approach this a bit more holistically maybe so at once the network thing there are many actors who have a, something interesting to to uh, contribute here, not only the museum, but also the problematic of beyond the work. I I, I just yeah I, I like uh, how, you, how you put this. Uh, as I said this morning, I was uh, or maybe I am still as an artist not very interested in having being part of a museum nor an archive. Uh, many artists would be probably, but um, but on on the other hand, um, there's a lot of questions inside um, archiving that are the same questions we are dealing with and we are um, researching. So in this way, this is a more a much more open and interesting collaboration to think: okay, what is care? What is um, a sustainability? Uh, what is network? a uh, living uh, uh, yeah, network and then th I think there we could meet each other and have a very interesting conversation if the conversation is um, how do we get tied down to the archive which is of course not I, I, it's not what we are having but then I think a lot of artists um, or it, I think it would dumb down a lot of artwork Yeah, no, I think it's a very good proposition indeed. Someone agrees here. <laughs> um, I think it's four, right? Yeah. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Um, no, it's a very good proposition, I think. And it's something that is, uh, has been discussed already for a while as well, within museums even, and, and how to change their, their roles as well, and whether or not they should not become facilitators also, not necessarily of a work, because yeah, particularly in digital art, but potentially also, I think, in performance art, what is the work? Is there still is that still the right term that we should use? You know, because the the work is so fixated on something, on an object most of the time. Where I think, well, it's much more than that. And uh, what you can see in in performance, and I think particularly you mentioned it already in your uh, story as well before that you say like, well, it evolves. You know, we take parts from one thing and it continues into the next and. That's something that happens a lot, of course. So there, you know, when, when does the work start and when does it end? It's really hard to say. But I think it's indeed by going through these processes. And again, that has happened uh, already as well uh, in, in different constellations. But it's very productive to, to think indeed from those positions. Well, if we don't have one thing anymore, if there is a process an evolving whatever, then what does that mean to the organization as such? Yeah, I'm, I feel a bit um, bad now because I'm a museum person, so I'll bring it back to the museum. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'll try to not make it too uh, museum-centered. No, um, because it's a bit maybe what to link to what you said. Because um, like a museum, in a way, is, is a is a is a memory machine, and it, and it's the question like to what degree is it a useful memory machine for the community which it serves, and in a way the protocols that it creates to preserve works and to do its work uh, sometimes maybe hinder more the effectiveness of the machine than, than, than that they do its, uh, they do its service. Um, but I think one of the things that I'm struggling with in the, in this, um, let's say in the current moment in this is, is in a way the, the question of digital, uh, the, the, the consequences of digital communication. And that in a sense, um, um, let's say the, 
the responsibility to care for memories is now distributed among so many, like among all of us, it's always been. But we produce so many traces uh, with the endless amount of emails and uh, let's say all the digital data that we produce that uh, let's say my, me and my small team are really unable to swim against the wave of data to make sense of what we should preserve or what we should not preserve. And I more and more feel that, maybe in line with Annette, that, that in a way we need a network of care, but also we need kind of a different sense of responsibility or a discussion about sense of responsibility that, um, let's say, what's your relationship with all these traces that you leave? And what is your, also maybe from an ecological perspective, what is your, your responsibility there? Because I think, like I've I've been involved in art museums, in tra uh, with a lot of artists in art schools, but we n I never really trained people or had a discussion about how do you manage your personal archive or what should you let's like, how do you relate to your in inbox or things like that. Uh, whereas maybe mundane as it is, in the end, let's say that's let's say I, I now have the feeling we're creating so many memories that we will not remember anything mm -hmm. in the end. But um, I think that's at the core of what we are up against. And uh, up against, I think it's a good thing. <laughs> uh, because we have to get away from the idea that we have in the Western world of memory. And memory as a sort of tangible, evidential, kind of neutral, objective. Forget it. Forget it. Let go of that idea and see what it brings. And I think that's going to be crucial uh, for the future. If we indeed intend to, you know, really stick some things around there. You know, have, have a memory but have the idea of memory in a different way. Can I, yeah. It's a, just a thought that maybe in the, in, I'm still searching uh, inside myself if I want to be archived or not, um, that if in a world where everything is memorable and everything is uh, searchable and, and like you can, everything's uh, uh, filmed, um, it's super nice to not be, to have this. It's also um, probably why why it works, the work we we do, because it's a Saturday morning, no one will ever know about, and and it's super intimate, and and there's a lot of care in being here right now. So um, maybe that is how it escapes like uh, the dogma of the of this time or something and what makes it unique to my opinion this last uh, couple of uh, answers and questions was a beautiful uh, closure to this wonderful panel. I mean, I think we all will remember the idea of network of care. And I think it's also a nice answer to Bartabara's question on ownership and maybe also on the challenge he posed this morning in his opening speech apparently about, um, well, the impossibility of a, of a museum to do this. Well, if we share responsibility and the care of this, this whole work, we might be able to do it, I think. Unfortunately, he's not here anymore, but I see there are many representatives of the museum, so he'll definitely get the message through. Thank you. Uh, when, please, can I welcome you once more to give a round of applause for this wonderful panel. Thank you. Thank you.